Our world is dominated by matter. However, there is also antimatter. Let us look at some examples. A proton is positively charged and the symbol is P. It has an opposite particle in the antiproton, which is negatively charged and indicated by P bar. When these two particles meet, the particle and the antiparticle, they destroy each other, they annihilate and two photons are released. Because the momentum before the annihilation was zero, the momentum afterwards has also to be zero. Therefore, the, the two photons, HF, are emitted in opposite directions. We can calculate the frequency of these photons by taking advantage of the equivalence of energy and matter as defined first by Einstein as E equals mc squared. What we need to do is look up the proton mass. mp, which is also the antiproton mass, mp bar is equal to 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. If we substitute in the energy matter equivalence, we find that each photon carries an energy of 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms times c squared, which is equal to 1.5 times 10 to the minus 10 joules. The frequency associated with this energy comes from the photon equation, which is E equals Planck's constant times frequency, which can be rearranged to give E to give F is equal to energy divided by Planck's constant. If we substitute, we obtain 1.5 times 10 to the minus 10 joules divided by 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 34 joules second, and uh, that turns out to be a frequency of 2.3 times 10 to the 23 hertz. The corresponding wavelengths can also be calculated. In order to achieve this, we write lambda is equal to speed of light divided by the frequency we just obtained, which gives 3 times 10 to the 8 meter per second divided by 2.3 times 10 to the 23 hertz. The result of this is the wavelength of 1.3 times 10 to the minus 15 meters, which is approximately the diameter of a nucleus. Not only protons have antiparticles, all fundamental particles have antiparticles with the exception of the photon. So also the electron, E minus, has an antiparticle in the positron, which is labeled E plus. Similarly to what we saw for the proton and the antiproton, when these two particles meet, they will destroy each other and photons are emitted in both directions of uh, opposite momentum and equal energy. Again, we can work out using the same approach the frequency of the photon. We write electron mass is equal to 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilogram. About 2000 times lighter than the mass of the proton. And uh, we substitute in um, the uh, energy mass equivalence, E equals mc squared. And uh, we obtain for the, um, the mass, for the energy associated with the, um, with the photon, this energy here, 8.2 .2 times 10 to the minus 14 joules. That's the photon energy. This can again be turned into a frequency by dividing by Planck's constant, F is equal to 
E photon divided by Planck's constant, which in this case gives 1.2 times 10 to the 20 hertz. The corresponding wavelength is equal to 2.5 times 10 to the minus 11 meter, which is now of the order of the diameter of the atom. So much larger than the, than the wavelengths we obtained earlier. Interestingly, this energy is often expressed in terms of kilo electron volts. This energy here often is often expressed in terms of kilo electron volts, and uh, the characteristic value is here 511 keV. And uh, 511 keV gamma ray photons are observed almost in every gamma ray spectrum that is recorded on on our planet because this annihilation radiation is quite abundant and a feature of nature. It can be shown that the energy of 8.2 times 10 to the minus 14 joules corresponds to 511 keV. This in SI units is the same as 511 in terms of keV. I'll quickly run through that calculation. Eight point two times ten to the minus fourteen joules is equal to eight point two times ten to the minus fourteen times one coulomb times one volt because one joule is exactly that one coulomb coulomb times one volt because energy potential energy is charge times potential difference. So this is one joule. If we then substitute, we obtain 8.2 times 10 to the minus 14 times E divided by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulomb times 1 volt. Here we have expressed one coulomb in terms of the elementary charge divided by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulomb. If we work this out, we obtain 5.1 times 10 to the 5 electron volts, which is approximately 511, 510 keV. And by working this out to more significant figures, we would obtain that that is the familiar number 511 keV which is observed in many gamma ray spectra. Gamma ray spectra are measurements of the intensity of gamma photons as a function of their energy measured in keV and they look often like this and the characteristic line is almost always the 511 keV gamma ray peak which is associated with the annihilation of positrons with electrons. Now, annihilation radiation is not just a fundamental feature of nature, but it also has very practical application. And those applications are illustrated in this example, which you find almost day to day, day by day, in a hospital in, a, in major capital cities. Matter, antimatter annihilation is used in PET tomography. This is a medical diagnostic technique which is used to identify tumors and the metabolism of tumors in patients. In this case, in this technique, one has a combination of two gamma ray detectors 
which can move about a circle whereby they're always facing each other. Inside this arrangement a patient is placed and scanned. So this is the scan arrangement. And what is measured is the intensity of gamma rays in coincidence, that means in coincidence, that means gamma rays that are detected at the, detected at the same time in both detectors, detector 1 and detector 2. Where do these gamma rays come from? They originate from inside the patient because inside the patient there will be an accumulation of positrons. These positrons are created because the patient the patient has been injected with a radioisotope that decays by also emitting positrons. A typical example of such a radioisotope is oxygen-14. Oxygen-14 is integrated into glucose The glucose then filled into the syringe in the correct amount and this is in fact uh, something we want to work out here in principle. What is the right amount of glucose and radioactivity that one should inject in, in such a situation? That's what this example is uh, focusing on. And oxygen-14 is a radioisotope with a radioactive half-life of 70.6 seconds and when it decays it will emit a positron. This positron will then easily find an electron in its vicinity and the two will annihilate as discussed before and out come the 511 keV photons back to back in opposite directions which are detected in coincidence by detector 1 and detector 2. That means the measured Radiation, which can be scanned through, identifies a position in the patient body, in the patient's body, where the glucose has accumulated, and that might well be a tumor.